February 4th, 1988 airing of the Will Schreiner Show was a tribute to the psychedelic 60s. It featured a Mamas and Papas vocalist and actress, Michelle Phillips, psychedelic advocate, Dr. Timothy Leary, Martin Lee, who wrote a book called Acid Dreams, and then Pam Roberts, a style expert, talking about the style of the time, and they're joined by comedian Rick Overton. So quite a little entertaining look at the 60s from like 36 years ago today. Because I'm uploading this on February 4th, 2024. Please welcome a fine actress and the author of this book, California Dreaming, Michelle Phillips. Michelle? I did. Uh, I do remember. It's such a memorable song, and I, I, I didn't know that you wrote it. I wrote it. I did just to keep it. <laughs> just not to infuriate John, John Phillips. Yeah, no, I, I co-wrote it with him. So now, tell me about growing up in the '60s. What was it like? Were you considered uh, a wild child of the '60s? It was a wild and crazy time. It was the uh, what do they call it? The Love Generation. Why, uh, why, why was that? Yeah. See, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I was just on well, the edge. I graduated high school like in 70. I don't know. I was in a very conventional marriage myself, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> I would have liked to know a little more about the love generation myself, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was just a period where people were more um, progressive. Mm -hmm. It was a very progressive time, and people... Uh, it seemed like we were going to move forward into... A of progressive thinking, which of course didn't happen. Right. <laughs> well, there was a little, little but it, for a stammer moment, it there. Yeah. For a moment, it seemed like we were going to. And yeah. It seemed like it was going to be incredibly fun there, you know, like it was for those few years. Uh, but then we, as a, a, as a community, I think, regressed. Oops. Just, you're, uh, <laughs> hey, man, you're like ripping up my candle scene here. <laughs> I got these all arranged just one way. Mm, they're beautiful. Now, where was this? Did, no, did, see, I can't, like, remember. But see, now, I see this stuff is, looks goofy to me. Did this look goofy in the 60s? Cass had pillows in her living room. That was, uh, this, was, this was what they were. She, she had great big throw pillows made out of that exact same fabric. And she also had a big tent dress made out of that. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> you never knew where you were lying, in the uh -huh. tent or the... The, the pillows. <laughs> I'm not touching that one. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> now, now you have your your daughter is now growing up and sort of following in your footsteps as an actress. Uh, I think we have a picture of China here. This is uh, it's an interesting name. That's a uh, very pretty yeah. girl. Why yeah. why the name China? Why not? You know what? Are you, what else are you gonna name him? Yeah. I was just trying to find something uh, different. And uh, I didn't know anybody named China, and that seemed like a good place to start. <laughs> well, in the 60s, that was the thing, you know, right, Moon everybody. and, you know, and, and yeah, you know, everybody. Chimney Log and all of these names. Right. Were right. As well, Grace, Grace Slick was going to name her daughter God. Mm -hmm. Remember? Well, you wouldn't remember, but anyhow, she was going to name her daughter God. And then at the last minute, she named her daughter China, too. Mm-hmm. You know, if we look at the 60s, what do you think it was all about, though, during those times? I mean, just having fun. Just having fun? Just having a great time and, uh, and dropping out. I mean, to just leave New York and go to the Virgin Islands and live in a commune and, and play guitars and, and take drugs and, uh, you know, have mm -hmm. a good time. Now, in, the New York, in New York, though, in the village, this was, this was a time where all of the music was happening in New York? Well, yeah, but it was not. In L.A., so thank God, you know, you could get out of New York and go to Los Angeles, which is, you know, what California Dream and the song was all about. I was really sick of New York. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so everything worked out perfectly for me. Mm -hmm. We moved out of New York, went to L.A., and got rich and famous. Yeah, and the book chronicles that whole period. It's real interesting. I was reading through it. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stories of the times then. You were somebody, and a thing I read, it said you were like the perfect girl for the 60s. 
<laughs> well, I had the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, you've had some interesting, some interesting people that you've been involved with over the years. Uh, but nothing as interesting as the 60s. Uh, it, I mean, what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. it really, uh, the, the, the 60s were fun, and, and you did as you pleased, and that was what was in vogue. Uh, to to be eccentric and to be different and uh, to do whatever was the establishment you did the opposite sure and yeah. uh, and we just got into it in a big way and yeah. had a great time doing it I would recommend it to people <laughs> get that three piece suit off and, and get into one of these babies and that's right you know, find your find your look. But now and your daughter, I mean, here's you raising a daughter. Your daughter's in her teens? She's 19. 19, so would you, but you wouldn't recommend she do the same thing, hop in a car and head, you know, head to another state completely she, unsupervised. You, you wouldn't cut her loose like that. You wouldn't uh, recommend that. She's a product of her own time. She wants a career. Yeah. <laughs> she wants, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I would recommend it. No, you're wrong. I would recommend it. I think it's a very, uh, uh, you know, it's a wonderful experience for everybody to be able to do that. And the minute you can't do that, the minute you you can't say to somebody that you really like or love or whatever and say, let's just get out of town for a month and a half or two months and go someplace and have fun. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very important component in, in living. Yeah. And how, how do you think you've changed, though, in the 70s and 80s? I got my collar caught on the <laughs> chair here. <laughs> got to get these taken in. I don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah, well, know. how did the uh, '70s change you? you? You didn't change at all in the '70s, or do you think? Well, uh, uh, I think n no. I, I don't think I changed that much. I mean, basically, I think that we are the same people we we grow up to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would. Um, I mean, I am I am still a very progressive person, and I'm uh, a fun-loving person, and. Uh, I, I don't want to get stuck in the rut of a decade like the 70s. Yeah. You know, please. Thank you. <laughs> one, one, one guy. Yeah. All right, we're going to break away. You know Tim Leary, right? Oh, my dear friend, Timmy. He, he's going to join us next and tell us uh, all about his version of the 60s. Tune in, turn on, and drop out. Is that what it was? That's a great philosophy. <laughs> okay, we're coming back. More of our show on the 60s right after this. Don't go away. guest is one of the leaders of the 60s counterculture. Please welcome the man who coined the phrase, turn on, tune in, and drop out, Dr. Timothy Leary. Now, did you guys' paths cross during those days? Yes, they did. I was, of course, an, a great fan then, as I am now. Sure. And uh, I spent a lot of time in Southern California. And uh, our paths continue to cross, I'm happy to say. <laughs> you, you said something that uh, struck me about Michelle, that she kind of represented the, the essence of the 60s. Sure. Uh, I agree with that, but I could add to it. Uh, Barbara, my wife, I'm sure you'll agree, uh, Michelle, is... Well, my scientific opinion, one of the most beautiful and intelligent, sophisticated, and discriminating women. And she's come to the conclusion that Michelle is the finest woman in Hollywood and perhaps uh, the world. <laughs> <laughs> so she's good for this. Uh, she's, uh, she's good for the 60s, but I'd say she's really perfect for the 80s. <laughs> Thank you, Timmy. <laughs> uh -huh, but why would you say that she was so much typical of the 60s girl? Well, she's happy, mm -hmm. and she's wholesome, and she's healthy, and she's full of good life and energy, and she's humorous. Uh, those are the four H's. Uh, yeah. and she, <laughs> four H, good four H girl. She's, uh, she's human, too. I think, wasn't it the four H club motto? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so now, the hippies of the 60s are now, you think they're the yuppies of the, of the 80s? Is that, the, uh, is that the, ge the generation change, and how they doing, you think? Well, anyone can write their script, but my version is this. In the uh, 60s, the baby boom generation, 76 million strong, 
were called uh, hippies. Uh, in the 50s, they were musketeers, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that's an improvement. <laughs> in the 70s, they were uh, yippies, and in the 80s, they are yuppies. Now, um, I happen to uh, approve of yuppies because, y to me, a yuppie is someone who is young, upscale, practical, pragmatic, hopefully professional, and uh, what's wrong with that? <laughs> or what's the opposite of a yuppie? <laughs> I, An old, uh, <laughs> old derelict, <laughs> low scale, <laughs> panhandler. <laughs> but I mean, the the long hairs of the '60s are now the balding guys of the '80s. You know, they. Uh... <laughs> well, not not you, but I mean, a lot of the you know a lot of the uh, the yuppies are are losing their hair and I guess uh, yeah. settle down. Yeah. As a as a philosopher and a sort of a commentator on our times, do you think that the uh, the '80s generation? Went, went along, grew and went, went the right way? Yeah, because you see, the Summer of Love was 67, uh -huh. but there was another Summer of Love in 68 and 69. Each year, as a new uh, crop of baby boomers uh, hit the streets. What, what, this, what is the Summer of Love? See, I, I, I know the term, but I'm not exactly sure. 67. Yeah, the Summer of Love. Mm -hmm. That's 21 years after the uh, baby boom started. And what it means is. I was 13, I was you know, missing out on it. Well, you're an uh, uh, honorary member, I think. <laughs> well, you certainly belong tonight. <laughs> well, welcome to the club. But uh, the spirit means uh, young people who want a change and uh, really uh, don't want the old Cold War, World War II stuff and uh, ain't going to work on Maggie's farm no more. The funny thing about it is, Will, that the same thing is happening right now in South Korea. You know, when you see young kids uh, throwing rocks at tanks, right. they learn that from American television. Mm -hmm. uh, it's happening of all places in the evil empire. I submit to you that um, this guy Gorbachev is a yuppie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say that? <laughs> he's young by Russian standards. Uh -huh, you know, the sure. former guys, they're uh, kind of uh, senile. And he's, <laughs> he's upscale. His wife, uh, Reza, reads Vogue magazine and has Paris fashions. Right. And has an American Express card. An American Express card, right. <laughs> and, and all good yuppies have an American Express card. Well, the Russian Express card, I think Yakov Smirnov has a thing, the Russian Express card, don't leave home. Oh, yeah. That's their <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's Yakov's joke. <laughs> Now tell me about the, the see, tune in, turn on, and drop out. That was a phrase that that, that sort of captured mm -hmm. you know, your your opinion of the '60s. Do you think people misinterpreted it? Well, people would do any damn thing they want. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but at that time, uh, I think that most people recognized it was an encouragement and an endorsement and a cheerleading. Um, um, notion of thinking for yourself, a dropping out of a blind conformity. Uh, don't take yourself so seriously. Uh, tune on. I mean, I mean, don't forget, we were coming out of the Eisenhower generation yeah. of a, a very boring, middle-class, suburban mm -hmm. America that had really just uh, uh, worn itself out and very thin. And I think that, that uh, young people wanted to have something new and something of their own. And they were sick of, uh, of the Vietnam War and they weren't going to be pushed around anymore by the establishment. And that's, uh, that had a lot to do with the, with the whole philosophy of burning your draft card, burning your bra. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, and I, it was, a, it was a, a great revolutionary statement. Yeah. But one thing, I, I'm sure you'd agree, Michelle, it was fun. I mean, there was not the sense of grim uh, know-it-all. It was a sense of experimentation, and uh, humor was the key to uh, laugh at uh, the uptight politicians and uh, you know. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And how have we come around now? How do you how do you find the '80s as a time, especially for time for 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 kids at the same when when we were all I guess you guys were were teens. I mean, how do you think teens deal with the '80s as opposed to the '60s? Well, you can't generalize about yeah. millions and millions of teenagers. I'm sure there are a lot of them out there that are thinking for themselves and having fun. I'd hate to be a teenager now because it's tough out there. As I said, that's what I would think. I mean, it'd be a tough yeah. time to grow up. You know, uh, kids today at the age of eight or nine can dial that 976 porn number. Mm -hmm. Now, I was 45 years old before I even knew such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, that's why uh, I, I, I agree with Nancy Reagan on that thing about say no about drugs, uh, because uh, kids, uh, it's a harder life, harder drugs today. Uh, 
it was different. Br- you know, I think yeah. that that in the '60s, our drugs were were uh, pot, and uh, good old great Mexican pot that was being <laughs> smuggled across the border in good old fashioned way, and and. <laughs> <laughs> You never saw any of that stuff going on, did you? We were experimenting with with LSD that was made in laboratories that 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 we were buying it directly from laboratories. It wasn't even it wasn't even illegal, you know. We were dealing in very uh, innocent uh, in in drugs in a very innocent way. Today, drugs are not innocent, and uh, and you just wouldn't buy anything. You wouldn't buy drugs off the street. Mm -hmm. It was a completely different era. It was uh, it was a very innocent time. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that? Why, why has it gone so hard? I mean, like you say, now it's everything's very, very dangerous. Things have, it, were people looking for a bigger thrill? No, I think things go in waves. I think that Reagan was elected because the country apparently wanted to uh, tone things down. The Reagan administration has been a tough, a military uh, Rambo uh, pit bull uh, attitude. Uh, it's swinging back though. It's it's a uh, glass nose is coming back to America. Mm-hmm. I, I sense it. But to go back to the kids and. My sense of concern for the kids today, uh, they, they, we've got to tell them to say no to drugs. But I tell my 14-year-old son, Zachary, don't be an impolite rep- Republican. Say, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we've we got to take a break here. We'll come back with more of our show in the 60s. Plus, Martin Lee looks at uh, LSD as it affected our society. Plus, fashions and a very funny comedian, Rick Overton. So we'll be back. Don't go away. <laughs> Yes, live the 60s, and he loved the 60s. He's a comedian and currently appearing in the new George Lucas, Ron Howard film, Willow. Please welcome Rick Overton. Rick. Welcome, welcome. Now, see, you're like me, the 60s. Yeah, that's right. You know, we were there, but we weren't really there. Oh, we were young, but we were plugging away, you know. We were yeah. conscious of the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> I went to peace marches oh, in New met- York, you know, and uh, we'd march for about a half a mile into Central Park and then uh, break up the pace. We'd run for our lives for another two miles or so <laughs> and take an ambulance home. That was fun. And, but the spirit was there. Uh, <laughs> you, th- you, think the 60- you think there'll be another era for you like the 60s? Well, you know, it goes in 20-year cycles. It's sort of like, you know, the 70s were like the 50s. They tried to do it. And then the 80s are trying to be like the 60s. And, oh, God, that'd be great when the 90s come around again. Disco's back. (laughs) (laughs) Now, now, who were your heroes, though, when you were growing up in Uh, the 60s? James Bond. Different set of heroes back then. It was James Bond. You know, the original Sean Connery. Yeah, sure, that... Yeah, vodka martini, shaken not stirred. <laughs> and you, then you phased into the 70s, you got Roger Moore, who's like new James Bond, light. <laughs> Less filling, and one-third the acting ability, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's one of his films. Just want to go out and see another movie, you know? Yeah. But now you got heroes like... Schwarzenegger and Stallone, that's the, the new uh, imagery. You like that, huh? Like a kind of build on a guy? I think it's important for a man's neck to be much bigger than his head. That's good, but... <laughs> usually, you know, a guy trying to prove something. I got a philosophy about working out. My philosophy is no pain, no pain! <laughs> An easy way to live, yeah. What else do you remember about the 60s, though? I mean, for me, you know, there's so, there's so much that I, you know, just sort of... That I, when, when I'm reading these books now, that comes back. Because uh, how old were you when you were 30? How old are you now? 30? 33. Yeah, 34. So we were just, we were just kids. We were yeah, innocent. Just innocent, kids. Innocent times. Yeah, sure. But uh, things, the, the influences that have been sticking with me ever since, like uh, 
Harley Davidson? <laughs> easy Rider. Oh, Easy, easy Rider. rider. Yeah. No, I was a film. That hit me. Seeing you had me jazz. confused for a second there when you did that move. Oh, yeah, my butt. No, <laughs> not, my butt had nothing to do with the 60s. <laughs> yeah, people trying to draw the connection. Oh, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Zap comic books, you know, question marks are shooting out of his head. <laughs> well, yeah, Easy Rider sort of, uh, what, what year was 68 Easy Rider came out? 69. 69? Yeah. Oh, I love that film. Jack Nicholson's introduction to major film stardom. Nick, 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 Nick. <laughs> Engine. Yeah. That's when a guy could get onto a Harley Davidson and explore himself, explore the country. Now they've got these new imports from Japan, this new, like, new 1988 organ donor motorcycle. <laughs> it's so fast, you get killed the instant you get off the lot there. Yeah. Thanks for the keys, yeah, pow, you're dead, instantly dead. They put a bungee cord on the back of the bike, whack, right back onto the lot. <laughs> These kids today. <laughs> <laughs> That was it. I mean, those were the times you, you were, I mean, it, you were what you drove. I mean, that was a big influence. You know, the muscle cars, I remember. That's in, in right. In the late I, 60s, I guess that was kind yes, of... Yes, in the early 70s, I got a job working for Chrysler, but when I was in uh, high school, I owned a 69 Dodge Charger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Remember metal? I used to make cars out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of those big, thick cars. You could hit a foreign car, be like, boom, was that a dog? Just turn the headlights off. Drive, just drive. <laughs> <laughs> One of those things, you put it into first gear, it's like <laughs> Velocity face from the 50s, you know, rocket to the moon. <laughs> Second gear, bang, you're in the twilight zone, hyperspace, you know, here comes the big eye. And, and it's hard to sneak back into the house when your dad knows. You're trying to come home late, you've been doing helium all night, and he goes, hey, were you doing helium? Why no. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta hold your breath. You let it go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we gotta cut away. We're gonna continue our show in the '60s right after this. Rick Overton, Kevin Ayer, Michelle Phelps, and a lot more coming up. A look at fashions right after this. Most memorable and lasting influences of the 60s were the clothes. And I think we need no explanation for that. My next guest joins us to show us how 60s fashion trends are really back in the 80s. Please welcome fashion reporter Pam Roberts. Pam. I guess the, the popular trends of the 60s was beads and paisley and all of this stuff. And the most important one right now, which is the return of the mini skirt, which I don't think anybody really expected. Oh, we're for that, we're for that. There's probably more men out there that are clapping for the mini skirt, but of course, you know, it is back again, and it was, <laughs> it was definitely a major part of the 60s, and that whole fashion revolution that sort of changed fashion completely because up until then everything was more sedate not so costumey all of a sudden women started wait, wait, this was sedate no uh, up until the 60s oh up until the 60s yes. oh in the 50s okay. they would have people never... were sedated is what they were saying <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right but then all of a sudden you know it all changed and then a lot of people thought that the the denim craze was part of the 60s but really it wasn't part of the fashion of the 60s it was more of the 70s uh -huh. but i brought today some... so you're saying rick is 10 years out of date here well n no <laughs> rick probably over well now they're still you know very important so it's gone 60s 70s 80s and it'll go well into the 90s uh -huh. as <laughs> Okay, thanks. 
some shots of, of some real 60s fashion so that you can see, sort of see the difference of then versus now. And, and there is a big difference, oh. even though the influence is still okay, around. Okay, let's take a look. Tell us what we're seeing. These okay. are some of the things. Okay, well, that's obviously Twiggy. For those of you that weren't born, she was the beginning of the whole slim trend that, that started in the 60s and one of the most popular models. And then these were some of the looks where you had the ripped and torn, shredded look. And then the, the swimwear, Rudy Gernrich, who was so popular and a very good friend of mine before he passed away. The psychedelics, that was probably the scariest of all the major fashion trends. And then th this is Lauren Hutton. She was one of the most top, the biggest models of that time, and she's still very beautiful. And, you know, all of the flamboyant hair, the makeup, the fake furs, everything was kind of nutty and crazy, and yet there was a slight sophistication to it because of our first lady and, um, you know, because it was a very strange kind of combination. of This was like the Cher, the bell-bottom Cher look, and I just prayed that bell-bottoms, I call them the dreaded bell-bottoms, never returned because they were very unflattering. And then this whole thing with shape, like the bell that you see here, and still that very severe kind of fashion influence that existed. Uh -huh. so, so, but I mean, everything repeats itself. So you have, you brought along fashions that are now in the 80s they're that are now in the 80s, reminiscent but they are, of the 60s. They're definitely reminiscent of the 60s. You want to take a look sure, at Sure, let's see what we have here. Okay, is, now, now hold on, because they may remind you very much mm. of the 60s. The first outfit is uh, by a company called Trip in New York City. And doesn't this remind you of Diana Ross? You know, with the whole fake fur, and then underneath, flower power seemed to be the, uh, the, the uh, kind of floral print of the day. And then all the psychedelic jewelry, strange looking accessories. But the thing that came to mind with the 80s is the over the knee boot that was right. popular in the 60s but is now very much in style. They're like wading boots or now, something. Right, they? exactly. <laughs> well, you know, also, Will. You, you don't know how hard it was for us in the 60s because the fabrics weren't very refined. It was very hard to bend down in a miniskirt then. Uh -huh. Well, then how are the fabrics different today? Oh. Because of the technology, not only have they changed the fabrics, but uh, anyone could bend down in one of these and they won't be showing, you know, everything that there was. To... Now, this I call the cage dress, because remember those girls in cages that did those strange kind of contortions? This is a combination of the cage dress and the drive-in movie dress, because anything with a zipper down the front in the 60s was a drive-in movie dress. Because you went to drive in and you needed a dress that was handy, and, and this would have been very appropriate. <laughs> yeah, the zipper does it all for yeah. you. Yeah, right. of sophistication and Jackie Kennedy Onassis, there was still this very refined look. However, this one is um, by Nancy Johnson and definitely very 80s with the long black spandex gloves and this beautiful crepe dress for day into evening. And now the big return of hats, though she wore a pillbox hat, this would be much more stylish now. And the little Chanel, lady-like handbag to go with that, that whole influence. So are all of those accessories? back into the 80s? They're, they're all coming back, the, the inspiration of the accessories and the whole look, but to repeat it the way it was, never. Hey. Now, you remember the dance called the swim, and everybody that had a swimsuit wore uh, ones that had cutouts, and again, you know, I'll repeat that Rudy Gernrick was the big designer. This is the swim dress over the swim suit in a bright, bright neon. That I know you'll probably remember this, Michelle, but when we wore our swimsuits, because of the fabric, they didn't adhere to our body. So when we went in the water and we came out, they would just, they'd fall off. Yeah! <laughs> oh. Oh. But now they stay on. <laughs> Isn't that great? Well, and we've got to get them back to that style. <laughs> okay, well, we'll tell. This, this one is by Le Surf, and it's a great-looking suit. It's yes, and I also remember in the 60s, when, did, when, did, when was it that uh, the girls had those uh, little skirts around there? That was the that was the '60s. The they had this skirt. kind of deal around there, right? Around this the this little peplum look. This was color blocking in the bright neon colors, and this one by Zoe is very updated with padded shoulders. That was another thing. People had very wimpy looking kind of shoulders, and everything was skin tight. Now it's a little more oversized, and the proportions of all of this are much different than they were then. And rather than you know painting your body, you just wear a pair of big earrings now yeah. because body painting was. A, a very big part of the 60s and pretty tacky too yeah I, I wasn't into body paints at all how long can you look at these colors before your optic nerve switches over <laughs> not long not long now remember go-go girls they were the flappers of the 60s 
And go-go girls, everyone was kind of a go-go girl when you went to school during the day, and then you became a cage girl like in the in the evening clothes. But this particular look <laughs> what, is... A go-go girl and a cage girl? Yeah, you know, you, you were a go-go girl, you know, in history, and then you went out at night and became the cage dancer, uh, <laughs> doing the jerk in a, in a cage. And so this was sort of the cleaned up version of that uh, that go-go girl. You know, of course, uh, again, this is an, a modern approach to it with the striped t-shirt and the jumper yeah. and the high boots. That looks very now. Sure, that could be very now. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh -huh. Now, I guess we're going to take a look at, at all of our fantastic looking models again. And Yeah, know. let's give our models a nice yeah. hand for being here. Thank you, ladies. Very nice. But nothing, nothing here though. Really, we said short skirts or short skirts are coming back. I mean, how short will they get? Nothing here really reflects that the. Uh, the I will tell you that short skirts are beginning now, and for the next five years, according to the fashion industry, it will be about the only length that will be out there. No more options anymore, like we've been giving ladies. But I think the short skirts here to stay for a while. Shorter and shorter till they look like a belt. Shorter and shorter. I guess. We understand. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> right, well, my no. grandma will be happy to hear that. <laughs> Here you go, Granny. Well, Pam, thank you so much for bringing these fine fashions. Pam Roberts, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back with a look at the 60s, some myths and realities right after this. Don't go away. My next guest is, <laughs> is very anxious, <laughs> but he's also an investigative journalist who has written a book. Uh, it's a fascinating history of the 60s titled Acid Dreams. Please welcome Martin Lee. Martin. <laughs> Now, why do you think this, this nostalgic uh, look at the 60s is so uh, pro popular today? Well, it was a very intense, exciting, turbulent period that uh, gave rise to all sorts of innovative forms of cultural protest, political protest. It was a moment when nearly everything was being questioned, most things tried, and an orgy of experiment that shook the nation and its roots. I think everyone here would attest to that. And nowhere was that <laughs> sense of experimentation more vividly uh, felt or expressed than in the Haight-Ashbury community of San Francisco in the mid-60s. That has the reputation of where everything sort of got going. Is that, is that a, a myth or is that uh, really the way it was? Well, it didn't really start there. Uh, in terms of the LSD counterculture, it actually starts back in the previous decade. The CIA was obsessed with LSD. Uh -huh, for, what, for what reason? They were trying to develop it as an espionage weapon, as a uh -huh. truth serum and so forth. Oh, as a, as a, tru as a truth serum? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what year was this where they started working oh, on it? Well, they started in 1951. Uh -huh. It's rather ironic when you consider so many young people in the 60s embraced LSD and sang the praises of the drug as a mind-expanding agent, mm -hmm. as a sacrament for inducing religious experiences, when 10, 15 years earlier, the same drug was used by the CIA and the U.S. Army not to expand the mind, but to control it, and not as a sacrament for a religious experience, but as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the CIA was so excited about the prospects of this drug that at one point a couple of CIA agents at the broad idea that they would put LSD in the punch served at the annual CI Christmas office party. This was in 1954. Really? <laughs> Ten and years before the, all the uh, acid rock extravaganza began. And uh -huh. So there, there were a number of these, uh, I guess you'd call them uh, characters or operatives that were working around. There was a guy, Albert, Alfred Hubbard. Oh, yeah. Well, Tim would know Al Hubbard. He was the, the oh. first Johnny Appleseed of LSD 10 years before Tim. He was a spy who, who spread really the drug colorful, around. Colorful, flamboyant, uh, mystery man. Uh, Probably a CIA agent, probably an agent of some mysterious police force that none of us even know uh, exists. Uh, and what, what, was he, what was he doing exactly? He was just he, going around. He uh, was the first one to come up with the idea that LSD shouldn't be used to disorient people, but it should be used to enlighten people. It should be used for religious experience and, and therapeutic insight and healing. He was the first one, and he was an intelligence operator to turn that. So it's rather ironic. Mm -hmm. Is that, was that when, when Timothy, when you were doing your testing, what, what, were, you, what were you looking for? What, with LSD. Well, we were at Harvard University from 1960 for about four years, and we had about 50 of the smartest philosophers and psychologists in the world uh, coming to work with us, Aldous Huxley and 
uh, Alan Watts and uh, Alan Ginsberg, and my old pal, uh, partner in time, Richard Alpert, Baba Ram Das, and oh yeah, it's a big center. Uh, but we were doing it to uh, give people access to their own brains and help people change their own minds as a tool for self-improvement. Uh, uh, well, none of us knew what the CIA was doing, uh, and then Marty uh, and his partner came along with this brilliant book and opened up the whole can of worms. Needless to say, the uh, CIA agents who took LSD in the 1950s were not compelled to grow their hair long and wear love beads and dress like you are now. Mm -hmm. Oh, am I dressed funny? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Quite it's not, I feel funny. I, this is, I probably never wore a tie in the 60s, and here I am overdressed for a TV show. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could have just worn something something cool and casual. But then there was rumors now that, like, a chromosome damage and all that stuff. And you, in your book, you talk about that this was all CIA. Um, there were a lot of myths associated with LSD and the counterculture in the 1960s. And one of the myths was that LSD caused chromosome damage and turned out not to be true. We know that from the CIA and the Army's own documents that were mm -hmm. once classified. They state that LSD causes less chromosome damage than caffeine. Mm -hmm. so, but they didn't let anybody know at this time when the, when the rumors were being spread and the disinformation was being spread, which is unfortunate because I think it would probably upset, upset people at the time. Yeah, I have to start your morning, morning off with a big hot piping cup of acid now every morning. <laughs> okay, honey, I'm going to work. Get the ants off me. <laughs> but I mean, LSD had a lot of negative effects. I mean, we really can't say that everything was just mind expansion involved around LSD. There were a lot of problems and, and, and things that came, they grew up out of, out of using the drug. I think what, perhaps what people in the 1960s were a little too eager in, in, in expecting great things from LSD and, and uh, and I remember Paul McCartney from the Beatles said if all the world's leaders would get together and take LSD, then the world would change overnight and the Vietnam War would end and so forth and so on. And you can look back on that and sort of chuckle. See, that's kind of naive and romantic and whatnot, but I think it's emblematic and of the optimism of the, of the period. Mm -hmm. and certainly the Beatles were the epitome of that optimism. Yeah. Now, in the book, you did a lot of research on the 60s, went through a lot of things. What were some other misconceptions that you found mm -hmm. in other areas around the 60s? Well... I think uh, oftentimes when people look back on the 60s, they're, 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 they get fixated on an image of the uh, uh, long-haired youth throwing rocks at policemen, burning American flags, and so forth and so on. And while that type of thing did happen to some extent at the end of the decade, I think it obscures the fact that the, the cultural and the political rebellion was by and large peaceful. That if anything, it was fueled by uh, an attempt by young people to make the country live up to the ideals and the principles that it supposedly stood for. In that sense, it was profoundly pro-American the 60s rebellion. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sort of one negative image that's kind of hung over about the violence. And, and it turns out uh, the, uh, the government, to some extent, was involved in fomenting the violence. In, in what way? I remember the Chicago uh, Convention, the Democratic Convention in right. 1968. It was a big tussle there on the streets. It was rather bloody. Uh, one person was even killed. Well, it turns out, uh, according to Army documents that have since been relieved, uh, released, one out of six protesters on the street during that period was an uh, undercover informant, undercover agent. And it seemed that some people in the government felt that if, uh, you know, it was advantageous to them to provoke violence. Mm -hmm. To incite because, violence, in yeah, fact. Yeah, because if the anti-war movement was perceived as being violent, uh, it would alienate a lot of Americans, a lot of mainstream people. And I think to some extent it did. Well, it's interesting stuff. The name of the book is Acid Dreams. Martin, thanks for being here. We're going to take a break and be back with more of our show on the 60s right after this. Don't go away. Some big success stories with Malcolm Forbes, Chuck Norris, and Happy Days creator Gary Marshall. We are back. We also want to thank, uh, special thanks to uh, Lisa Law for letting us use many of the photos that we've shown today. Uh, it's a book called Flashing on the 60s. Well, what do you think? The 60s, when we turn to the year 2000, what do you think will most be remembered for each of you? The, the music, the culture, the clothes? What do you think will stand out in your memory? Well, there's this assumption that the 60s stopped. The 60s is going. Anytime young people think for themselves and decide to change things, call, label it 60s. It's right here on this couch. Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of 60s spirit up there, so uh, don't let them bury it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's, something, there's something real interesting I read in, one, in the article that you talk about how much the media has an impact on, on our culture. We live totally in a media culture. Uh, 
<laughs> but what are we doing right here? <laughs> but in Hollywood, it's all uh, image and it's all ideas, and it's wonderful <clears throat> that we're getting these ideas out and the competition of uh, ideas. And, yeah. uh, I, I have a prediction. I think that, that the 90s that are, are really going to be um, almost like a replay of what we s call the 60s. Uh, it's going to be a whole, there's going to be a whole revolution in, in, in politics. There's going to be a revolution in fashion and in music. And, and uh, that happens every few decades. But I think that it's, it, it will happen again in the 90s. I, that's when I envision it. And uh, th so that's when it must be happening. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean disco's not coming back? I hope not. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Well, we've run out of time. I thank all of you for being here. Michelle Phillips, good luck with the movie based on the book, uh, California you. Dreamin'. We'll look for that soon. Timothy Leary, come back and visit with us again. Good luck with everything. Rick Overton, you'll be uh, doing your stand-up comedy, and your new movie is called Willow. Look for that in the theater near you. Martin, thanks so much for being here. Interesting. That's our show. I want to thank everybody, including Lisa Law, for bringing us these fine photos. I also want to thank Pam Roberts and the models and the 60s fashions. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>